Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in the series of series weekly winter webinars. Thank you all so very much for coming and being part of our discussion today. Our topic um, for this webinar is transformation and resurgence, new economies and localization. My name's Cinnamon Evans. I'm the CEO of Series Community Environment Park in Melbourne, Australia. Before we begin, I acknowledge that we're meeting virtually on the country of the Aboriginal people of Australia, and many of us being in Melbourne are on the country of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay respects to all Indigenous elders and communities who are particularly at risk at this time. I also acknowledge that we're in a time of multiple intersecting crises. Obviously, we're in the midst of a health and economic crisis, and at the same time, the climate and ecological crisis continues. Clearly, this is a very difficult time for all people on planet Earth. And I'm very, very grateful to all those who are working to protect our Earth and our future. At Ceres, we want to help people fall in love with the Earth again. We do this in three main ways. By stewarding a park in East Brunswick and a market garden in Coburg, where people can come together to connect with each other and with the earth. We do this by providing education programs for people of all ages that enable them to gain knowledge and skills and develop leadership for our changing times. And we also provide an integrated collection of social enterprises that enable people to live their material lives in a manner more consistent with their values. This webinar is brought to you by the Ceres School of Nature and Climate, which encompasses all of our education programs. The webinar series has covered a number of our learning areas or the branches in our tree. The first webinar two weeks ago was about permaculture. Last week, we spoke about regenerative agriculture. Today, we're talking about new economies and localization and next week we'll be talking about climate and natural systems. Next week's topic is what have we learned about our resilience and behaviours during COVID-19 and how are we better placed to act on climate change. But back to today's conversation. Transformation and resurgence, new economies and localization. To briefly summarise the basic premise of our discussion, I'd like to offer this quote from Helena Norberg-Hodge. Shifting from global to local is a systemic strategy to move us from a fragmented and confused world dominated by almost invisible distant economic forces towards an interconnected and diversified world that is the foundation of happy individuals peaceful societies, and a healthy planet. Today, I'm joined by three highly regarded speakers, Barry Liberman, Joe Barraquette, and Nick Beginnis. I'll say a bit more about each just before they speak. As we go, if you have questions for our speakers, please submit these via the Q&A function on the webinar. We'll come back to these in the second half hour. Also, any links or references mentioned by the speakers will be posted in the chat. So now to our first speaker. Barry Lieberman is the co-founder of Small Giants Impact Investment Firm and Editor-in-Chief of Dumbo Feather. Barry and her husband, Danny, founded Small Giants in 2007 to support a new breed of businesses that are focused on empathy and building strong communities. They fund and manage a portfolio of companies as tools for social and environmental impact. To shift away from blind faith in economics and instead embrace ecology as the path to living a life of passion and purpose. Welcome, Barry. I'm unmuting. Thanks, Cinnamon. Sorry, Tech. So, Barry, tell us about your approach to building and supporting new economy. Um, it's a big question. 
uh, and one that we're really devoting the sort of second part of our lives to pretty much entirely in focus. I'm glad you mentioned Helena. Helena Norberg Hodge has got, um, this is something worth putting in the chat. She's got the World Localization Day, which is on Sunday, and that'll be really worth anyone who's interested in this topic. Um, I'll get the link into the chat. And she co-edited this issue of Dumbo Feta on localization. And um, we focused on it because it feels like medicine for our time. The idea that globalization was gonna be a kind of fantasy way we could run the world. Uh, you can see all the cracks of that. It, from the fires to COVID, we're seeing all the tension in that. And I work across a lot of different sectors from Mossy Willow Farm on the Mornington Peninsula, which is um, one of our businesses in our family of businesses, at small giants, to funds management, to media, Dumbo Feather, all the work we're doing. It feels like now is the time for local resilience and regeneration. And we can't be, we have to think lo lo global and act local. And it just feels for everything we're doing like the right focus now. Thanks, Barry. So what is it about the these current times that bring it into sharp focus? You mentioned cracks um, and tensions in the system. Globalization as a globalization, the economy itself is an incredibly brittle and fragile meta structure and paradigm that we're all living within and it's been broken for a long time um like what i just love that slide you had for series to help people fall in love with the earth again we're saying really essential things black lives matter well of course black lives more than matter but we're trying to agree on essential agreements that have been taken from us with the globalization strategy where shipping salmon from wild salmon from Norway to China to be deboned and shipped back to Norway to be packaged in Norway and sold in the supermarkets. We've broken all of our natural systems and all of our social systems with the way that we run our world. And so localization is a way of recentering ourselves in our homes and our communities and reintegrating kind of resilience against and it can be a negative and a positive we, we resilience and regeneration is a way of restoring our local ecosystems both social and ecological and um and it helps us act better globally because we're not relying on um centralized systems that are inherently fragile so getting um decentralizing our energy needs, our water needs, our food needs, um, and reconnecting with our local communities is good for us. It's good for the planet. And the overall goal is to shift from the current economic paradigm, which is reliant on um, endless growth, which denies the en endless depletion um, curve and extraction curve. And our focus at Small Giants generally is to try and live in the donut economy, which is in the sweet spot between the bounds of the ecology and towards human flourishing. And that can only really happen, we feel, in a very localised way where we invest all of our capital where we live and where we love. Mm. Thanks, Barry. And that, um, tell us a bit about Small Giants and Dumbo Feather, just to complete... Um... Oh, thank you. Thanks for that. I didn't have an issue right next to me to hold up. I feel bad. So this issue is rad. That's David Holmgren, total legend on the cover. And um, in the five interviews in Dumbo Feather, we're really talking about five nodes of localization that are really cool. I interviewed um, the ex-mayor of Froome, Froome, F-R-O-M-E. They're an amazing example of local governance um, disruption. He wrote... Um, Peter McFadden wrote the book Flat Pack Democracy. It's worth checking out. It is insanely cool. They took over their local council. Um, in his words, I think he said the local council was committed to being average. <laughs> they, <laughs> they took over the council to really revitalise their world that they live in, their home, their community, their council. And they've done it with such incredible grace and inclusion. That's an incredible example. So... 
um, local governance, revitalization, uh, local skills and knowledge sharing is another thing we're covering there, uh, revitalizing the household and the suburb, the community. Um, we've got an, an incredible indigenous legend from the US, Pat McCabe. She talks about um, incorporating local indigenous knowledge and wisdom. And um, then we speak to Johan Hari, who talks about the psychological benefits of connecting to community. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's Dumbo Feather, just trying to tell those stories of how people on the ground are revitalizing their local world. And you can take that across sectors from the built environment to regenerative agriculture to um, financing models. So there's something called the Village Well, which we've been, um, my husband Danny's been a part of creating up in Byron Bay, which is a local bank which maybe one day we can have a local currency. And all of these things invest, that they keep the money swelling within. So instead of investing in the big four banks or lending, getting lending from them, et cetera, where you don't know where your money goes, where you sleep, when you sleep at night, um, investing locally, you know that it stays circulating in your local economy. So it's the revitalization of all of those systems. That's what Small Giants is really focusing on. Mm. Thanks very much, Barry. And just to, uh, I really liked a couple of things you just said. Um, uh, earlier you spoke about trying to agree, I'm trying to make essential agreements that have been taken from us and about keeping the money within. I really, those two principles are, are really um, important, I think. Um, thanks, we'll um, hear more from you in the conversation shortly. Um, but I'd like to move now to our second speaker, um, Professor Joe Barraquet. Um, Joe is the Deputy Chairperson of Ceres and also the Director of the Centre for Social Impact Swinburne. She's Australia's premier researcher of social enterprise with extensive experience in non-profit governance, social enterprise policy and practice and measuring social impact. She's passionate about the value of diverse societies and community-led approaches to social change and she also loves Ceres. Joe, welcome. Sorry, mouse Hi, issues. Joe. I'm here now. <laughs> Joe, tell us about your work and approach to building and supporting the new economy. Um, so the Centre for Social Impact at Swinburne is a, a research and graduate education centre primarily. And so we do the things that one would expect of centres located within the university system. But I guess what we're particularly interested in is the role of social economy in creating more sustainable futures and also the ways in which we can do research and education differently so that we actually achieve the kind of social impacts we want to see in the world. So um, particularly around the research area, I guess what we're really keen on at the moment is what we call a transdisciplinary research agenda. That's big language for making sure that we do research in real time working with people from across sectors from the start, doing really quick prototyping and testing and learning as we go and reinvesting that information um, quickly and also making sure that we really properly translate the kind of things that we all find together in research and make sure that, that the uh, potential impact of that gets amplified by making sure that it gets out there quickly. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, broadly what's going on from an observational perspective as a researcher, in relation to um, localization and relocalization, if you like, as a result of some of the crises we're experiencing at the moment and recognizing your earlier acknowledgement, um, Cinnamon, that this is operating within a wider ecological crisis that's been ongoing for many, many years and acknowledging Barry's comments that, you know, there, there was nothing not broken about the mainstream economy when we started um, the current um, raft of problems. I guess a couple, a few things that I've observed and wanted to highlight. Um, first is um, really, uh, as Barry was talking about, you know, the localization of um, distribution systems and shortening supply chains, uh, et cetera. And we're really seeing that, I was really observing in relation to um, particularly uh, the COVID uh, issues, what I call the value of distributed scale. So instead of having conversations constantly about scaling up, what does distributed scale look like? And a practical example of that was the Moving Feast initiative that um, a number of social enterprises uh, in uh, Victoria have gotten involved in, in providing emergency food relief. And um, while I'm certainly not in any way involved in that, when that um, uh, initiative was first raised and discussed with me, it was really um, 
immediately clear that there was a whole lot of, for example, um, commercial kitchens that were sitting in isolation across the city. Um, and that created a safety net, uh, mobilising those created a safety net because it meant that if there was an outbreak in a particular kitchen, not every part of the supply system would be damaged. So there was an immediate potential there. That combined with the fact that social enterprises, despite operating in the market, do tend to be collaborative with each other, meant that they had the infrastructure there to get something going really quickly. So you see that distributed scale working. Um, another comment really quickly is about the importance of the care economy. So economic geographers, particularly those who are specialists in diverse economies, make a distinction between the care economy and the productive economy. And we're not, I'm not applying particular um, values to either of those, but the productive economy would what we normally think about as the market economy. And the care economy is that part of the economic uh, iceberg that sits below the surface, the largest part, which is uh, reciprocity and care between neighbours, women's unpaid labour, um, other people's unpaid labour um, and our volunteering types, type of activities. That's the caring economy. And in relation to the bushfires, we saw really quickly the caring economy um, kick into gear. And those of you who know about the Find a Bed um, uh, online platform and, and organisation would be aware that Find a Bed immediately emerged um, through leadership of particular people um, to create an opportunity to connect people who'd you know, lost, literally lost their beds uh, and getting them into um, uh, secure uh, emergency housing straight away. Um, we're also seeing that in relation to COVID. I'm sure amongst all of our neighbourhoods, we're all, um, you know, we've got various um, household WhatsApp arrangements and um, things being set up to make sure that we are keeping an eye on elderly neighbours and all those sorts of things. So the, the value of the care economy has suddenly come to the fore in a way it hasn't for a long time. And I guess the other thing is, you know, our, our increased awareness of the importance of self-sufficiency. And I know at series, uh, in series nursery, um, we experienced the effects of panic gardening, um, which immediately kicked off once uh, we became aware of COVID-19 and people became concerned about um, food security. And, uh, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of that revival, some of it coming from a place of panic, but some of it coming from a place of, you know, re-embracing what we know maintains our sustainability. Thanks very much, Joe. I really um, like the way you gave um, very um, practical examples of some of the um, ideas you were talking about. I'm interested in the, in your view, if there's interchangeability or distinction between terms like new economy, social economy, and another term I've heard, solidarity economy. Do you distinguish between those or do you, uh, what's your view on that? Uh, I do because I'm an academic and I know what the etymology of each of those terms is, but I'm not going to bore everyone senselessly oh, with this lecture on it. I was thinking you might have. <laughs> I'll give you. I'll give you. A, I'll give you a short answer. So, um, the solidarity economy um, terminology was actually created by people interested in cooperative and mutual forms of social action, and they were seeking to distinguish from the social economy because the social economy is a broader concept that includes. Um, welfare interventions and um, forms of social enterprise that don't involve stakeholders in their operations. So that solidarity economy terminology was trying to, I guess, re-invoke the sense of collective, the value of collectivism in uh, economic organisation. Uh, and then the new economy um, is wider than the social economy. So the new economy is referring to all the forms of economic social innovation that may be um, being produced. And that includes, so going back to what Barry was talking about, you know, the concepts of the donut economy, et cetera. Um, not every social enterprise would weigh into that, but that's all part of new economic activity. So um, new, economic, new economy is probably the broadest term. Social economy is one piece of the new economy. And then solidarity economy sits across both, but uh, tries to dis distinguish itself in terms of member ownership um, and economic democracy, if you like. Thanks very much, Joe. I find that very um, useful um, going forward in this conversation and, and in generally thinking about these topics. Um, we'll come back to you, Joe, in the um, group discussion, um, but we'll move on now to our third speaker. Um, Nick McGuinness is the CEO of Senvic um, Social Enterprise Network Victoria. 
He's an innovative, energetic and strategic executive that has led dynamic and diverse workforces across the public, private and community sector in Victoria and in the United Kingdom. Nick is currently chair of Melbourne Fringe and recently launched Common Rooms, a new venue at Trades Hall in Carlton that uses social enterprise to provide a space where uncommon people belong. Nick, hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks, um, Joe was just talking about the new economy and um, all forms of um, economic social innovation. Um, and so you're the chair of Sendvik. Tell us about your approach to building and supporting the new economy. Um, uh, so oh, yeah, Sendvik's very new, as you know. Um, it's uh, only just emerged um, in, look, really in the past year from a collaboration between some pioneers in the social enterprise um, sector in Victoria. Um, I, I'm not sure the audience for this group today, so um, I'm not sure how fast to move with some of these things. Um, uh, but social enterprise um, is something that, in, in my view, has existed for a very long time in Victoria. And the, and the word social enterprise um, has really just gained more momentum in Australia, but has been used for many years overseas, particularly in the UK and in Canada. Um, in, in Scotland, they've, they've got a network that's existed for 15, perhaps, you know, more, more years than that, 20 years, um, and it's really mature. And here, it's still quite new, but I don't think the concepts are, are, are that, um, that new. Uh, sorry, the, the concepts are actually quite old. Um, but the network has it emerged out of the community that realised that for the social enterprise community to thrive here, we need to come together and support the ecosystem. And part of this is um, uh, about just the unique space that social enterprise exists between mainstream business and the charity sector. You know, social enterprise is this hybrid between the two that is um, that exists for either social purposes or for environmental purposes. And through that, um, it's, it's a unique set of skills of networks of, um, uh, you know, it's a whole way of doing business. And so that's why it's really important that the, the ecosystem around it is, is strong and is appropriate. So, and when I say the ecosystem around it, we're talking about the regulatory environment, the way government approaches that, that community, the way it's financed, um, the way customers who are interested in social enterprises or environmentally responsible products or services, they know how to seek them out. So at the moment, I, I find myself, um, it's now six months at Senvik and we're still establishing ourselves. Um, we're establishing ourselves in the sense of um, even our own value to the members of our own community, but also um, just people getting their heads around what it is and why it's the way of the future. Um, I, uh, I really connected with lots of what Joe, Joe was saying before in the sense of, um, you know, there's lots of different words that have been used, you know, and now social enterprise, like we are certainly adopting the new economy, that language in particular, but very aware that within that, there is the solidarity economy. Um, there's those who, who um, uh, there are those social enterprises that are, that exist really to provide employment, to provide dignity and empowerment to people who are marginalised by mainstream employment, whether that's through their refugee status or whether um, they have a disability and struggle to find employment, whether they have a criminal record um, or whether you know, they've suffered, um, they've experienced homelessness for much of their life, they are at an economic disadvantage and have been very much cast aside by mainstream economy. There's many social enterprises in our um, broad church that exist to support them. And then there are others that are trying to, um, uh, are doing innovation in the, in the area of you know, um, green technology or whether that's um, uh, you know, trying to support the environment with, with, with products and services that the mainstream economy hasn't valued until now. Um, so there's, it's a very broad family and for a network 
um, you know, we're stretched across trying to um, connect with all of those um, different groups. Um, and the and I suppose just to pick up the language, the importance of language is key. And for me, I've adopted new economy because there's very much um, there's very there's lots of different audiences at the moment. Um, there are those who are converted already, who perhaps are already part of the solidarity economy without knowing it. Um, and those who are running social enterprises but don't identify as a social enterprise. And so I think it's really important to have language that people can connect to um, without, so that, so that perhaps they can get deeper into it, you know, so that we um, can crack through the echo chambers that exist today with, you know, social media, with Facebook and all the different ways that our, the way we, inf we gather information is, um, synthesized you know i think that's really the great next step for social enterprise in australia is to move from being you know this hybrid in between two very well understood you know entities of charity and business to actually being the the primary way to do business the way that we want the next generation to understand is the way to do business so these are all big ambitious visions um and uh you know we're we're um I suppose we're still making first steps. Thanks, Nick. I really um, like the I like the size of that vision um, and the way that um, you understand that social enterprise is an absolutely a key contributor to um, the new economy. Um, thanks very much. And um, so we'll um, move now towards questions. And we have a number of questions coming in from um, the people attending our webinar today. Um, so we'll open up to the panel and uh, anyone who would like to ask a question, please do that through the Q&A function. Um, and we have an opportunity to give uh, those who wish to, to give, give you the mic so that you can ask the question yourself. Um, so I'm just uh, checking. Um, we'll go to Alexa. I think Lorna um, will give the mic to Alexa so you can ask a question, Alexa. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, I wrote my question down, um, but I, I guess I was wondering how we deal with uh, global issues um, with localised economies, how we still connect um, while we're mostly investing in our local areas, and also how we avoid uh, wealthy areas keeping their wealth within their localities and therefore leaving perhaps poorer areas with less circulating within their economies. Um, thank you. Thanks, Alexa. So that's a really great question. And there are two parts there. One is how we, um, you know, address global issues whilst also localising our economy. And the other is about how we address disparity. If we are becoming truly local, how we address disparity between local economies. Much more succinct. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll throw this to the panel. Um, who would like to respond? I'd kind of love to talk to Nick and Joe forever. <laughs> you guys said so many awesome things and um, we could probably just spend the rest of the hour talking about language because that was super interesting. Um, but maybe we should talk about this really compelling stuff. Um, Joe, you go first. Oh, okay. Um, so Alexa, I think you've picked up on something really important and I, I know that Barry also intimated it and I'm, being an academic, I always refer to my academic sources. So Ash Amin, who's a great economic so uh, geographer, um, talked about the danger of what he called container spaces and, you know, a container space logic to localization. And it's really, as you've observed, that doesn't help solve global problems. Um, if you are sitting in isolation and being highly self-referential, what we need is what the academics call linking social capital, which is um, we have our intern, you know, our local um, resources um, being well developed and resilient, but that we've also got strong linking uh, to what's going on around us and to other communities. Um, and I think that that's critically important and it's not something that should be dropped off any discussion about localization in uh, 2021 because you know, our global future um, is a shared endeavour and a shared uh, risk. 
Um, so that's the answer to that part of the question. In terms of the distribution of resources, I guess in a way, um, the sort of going back to some of what Barry said, uh, the the current concentration of resources in neighbourhoods, etc., is actually a legacy of the mainstream economy. And um, while I don't mean to be all Pollyanna-esque about what can be done about that because it's not easily reversed, I think we need to also maintain an awareness about that. You know, we don't. When, when we do have gentrification, when we do create built environments that mean that certain people are shut out, that's when you don't have that kind of egalitarianism or potential for egalitarianism within particular places. And then the other thing is government. You know, government is our redistributive channel and uh, we need to make more of it. And, it, you know, there's no question that it's a challenge because, because neoliberalism is the strongest kind of impulse that underpins government at the moment. Um, but we need to keep having that conversation with government. They, government is our primary channel for distributing resources equitably. Mm. So can I add, add to that? Yes. Um, so I think what you should do is go to the CENVIX website and <laughs> join us. That's what you should do. Um, this is this is important because um, Senvix here to build a network and build a community of people who who want to make these kinds of uh, changes. So it's it is about knowing where the local activities are going on um, and where you might be able to either participate or even just become you know a, a, a purchaser or a supporter in lots of different ways. Senvic at the moment is still growing and there are sub networks naturally forming in response to the current you know, crisis that we're in. Joe mentioned earlier, Moving Feast. I mean, that's an example of a, a food system that got together in response to you know, the, the relief that was needed at the time and also the lack, um, you know, the, the underutilized kitchens across metropolitan Melbourne. There are lots of other um, innovations like that that have come about, such as homelessness um, and the, the availability of housing um, in uh, apartments that weren't used. And these collaborations happen when networks connect and talk about how to respond to a particular problem. Um, and that's why just knowing who's there and who's interested is a really key part of moving forward. This, these are field-driven solutions, um, and that's what Senvic is partly playing that role to try and coordinate that. Um, another example is in Gippsland. We've got a great group out there that have come together to engage local government in a unique way and to um, find support from business in that area to help um, the social and environmental aims of, of the network, the sub-network of Senvic that, that is existing out there. So I don't do it for selfish reasons, but I do say, you know, connect with Senvic because th th this is why we exist. You know, we have a very broad umbrella in terms of what we cover and um, it's, it's where people want to put their energy is where we go. Thanks, Nick. Um, Barry, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I've got so much to say and it's really <laughs> controversial as well. So I'm sitting here going, oh, oh far out. Say, um, <laughs> say. Everything that we've just said, yes. Yes and yes. Um, I think finding what is alive in your local network, what is alive as a model in Australia, the UK, the US, there is so much happening. This issue of Dumbo Feather highlights some of those things. It's nice to have a tangible way of um, seeing what's going on around the world and being inspired. Um, I think there are a lot of tensions here that are not only not resolved, but there are millions of people on the street because these issues are uh, monsters. These are monstrous issues because it's inbuilt to our economy, our global economy. What has been valued and what has been devalued and destroyed happens right at the centre and the core of the organising principle of how we uh, do business, uh, how money circulates around the world. So I come from privilege and when I first heard 15 years ago about the idea of triple bottom line, people, planet and profit, I was like, Oh my God, we're fucking done. Oh, sorry, can I swear? Um, it's not TV. Um, oh my God, we're done. Like, we've just solved it. People, planet, profit, all in favour say I. Crickets. Oh. <laughs> Actually, crickets. Because when you're talking, the things we're talking about is the tension I live with every day, the difference between philanthropy 
and core capital. Now you cannot fix a trillion dollar hole, even with a hundred million dollars worth of philanthropy and activism. And that's where the wickedness lies mm. in that we need to find ways to convince, convert, connect core capital in the economy with these wicked problems. When you have an infrastructure globally of fossil fuel, the fossil fuel infrastructure has been built over decades and it is apparently, I heard this statistic recently or this fact recently that may not be a fact, so forgive me. Uh, it, I think that the global fossil fuel infrastructure is worth more than the US economy. So these are enormous pivots that we're needing to do and enormous pivots we're asking governments to do. So I'm, I, you know, I've been trying to make impact investing look sexy, feel sexy by the model of small giants. I'm like, hey, I'm outperforming the market. This is awesome. Not only is it like the right thing to do, but often human beings don't do the right thing for the right reasons. We do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of paradox and a lot of uncomfortable stuff we have to acknowledge about how we function and the system we've designed ourselves into and um, and I think that we have to um, find a way to make the economy win-win so that entrepreneurialism doesn't die um, so that it isn't we're calling it the new economy, but actually our podcast series and masterclass series we're about to launch, we're calling the next economy. So I've just thrown in another thing. Um, because <laughs> there was an argument that like, we can't call it the new economy because it's like saying this is new and that is old. It's not this and that, it's something, it's next. God help me, I don't know what to call it. We're calling it the next economy. Um, and uh, social enterprise versus like the change, we have to look at the shadow and the shadow lives where money and power lives. Now, not like it's hard to convert core capital. We are 100% impact investors. So we invest 100% of our core capital in creating a meaningful world and a world we feel we can live our children, your children, our grandchildren, you know, our collective we. So it's pivoting from a me economy to a we economy. That is some heavy lifting and um, the intersection between Black Lives Matter and environmentalism and what we're talking, the, the, everything is woven in. And I worry about focusing on philanthropy when the thing that's really causing the damage is core capital of all, all of our economies, our private portfolios, where our, um, our um, super lives, you know. The super funds around Australia should be mandated to invest in a resilient and regenerative Australia. And then we should have a conversation about what that means. Then we'll see some serious movement on the ground. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, we should revitalize our local councils, make movement in our, you know, we, we've got to do what we can. Um, and I'm obsessed with the larger wicked problems and how, how, we, how we move it. And maybe global warming is just gonna move it all for us. But at the moment, it's, it's a hard conversion piece. Most people with high net worth, for example, or, or super funds or you name it, they've just lost 20, 30% in the market crash. You try to convince them now to pivot to a renewables infrastructure. Like how, why would they do it? Because it's the right thing to do? Governments want to look like they're revitalising the economy and the way to do that is with the infrastructure that exists. So this is a really nuanced, really, really complex conversation and um, I could have it all day, every day. <laughs> wow, thanks, Barry. Um, it's, you're right. It's absolutely, it, it's, monster, it's, a, it's a great big monster and um, we've got a lot of work to do. I've heard a few... Um, uh, of you mention um, sprinkles throughout about the role of government. Um, and Sita has a question um, for Barry about the role of government. Um, Lorna, can we invite Sita to ask the question? Hi, Barry. Um, thanks for that. That was so exciting. <laughs> and I love the bigger, wicked problems and all of that. Um, but my question is more, I guess, around local. Um, closer to home. Um, so just um, your interview with Peter McFadgen in the latest issue of Dumbo Feather, I just wondered what maybe you learnt from him about how Australian councils can be, was it better than, did you say average? <laughs> yeah, I think he used a better word than that. Um, yeah, what I learnt from Peter so much. It's so simple, really. 
there was just a whole lot of them got together at the pub and they were from, and this is really where I think the rubber meets the road. They were not politically aligned, mm -hmm. those, those 10 people who met at the pub. And they, um, but they all agreed that their local community was just like the council was just an, a 19th century model of what a British council should do. These are the requirements. And so they kind of said, well, that's rubbish. We want, we want to wake up our community. So they all ran on independent platforms. And um, I said to him, are you saying you stack the council? And he goes, is that what you call it in Australia? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but they did, but they didn't, they did it with kindness. So, cause that was a big thing that I asked him about. Um, not, um, it shouldn't be an us against them. It's just, if you've got really, uh, for me, it's, it's what brings life and what gives life to you, your family and your community. Mm. We don't even ask those questions anymore. You know, um, series brings life to the neighbourhood. I went there for an early morning um, fire one day and it just, the aliveness in my body, in my spirit, was extraordinary. So that's what they did. I'd get flat pack democracy. I'd read the article in Dumbo Feather. It's totally rad. He goes through it. It's complex, but it's the idea of um, moving from being consumers to citizens again mm. and really, really thinking about what that means to you. What does that mean to you as an individual? And then showing up for that. And I think the showing upness is how we get to a we economy instead of a me economy. We've been convinced that we are not important to each other. And um, of course, it's not true. Mm. Thanks, Barry. Um, so from Nick or Joe, anything about the role of government before we move on to next questions? Uh, I think there's quite a few questions there. So I'll just yeah. be quiet. <laughs> There are some questions from Nasran about kids, teens and adolescents and, um, and how we, um, you know, engage our younger um, humans in these questions and engage them in new economy. So Nasran? Hello. Can you Hello. hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, Hi. So I just read my question uh, kids teens and adolescents demographic is a huge consuming and waste production section without knowing themselves so what role for these younger humans do you identify in impacting new economy thanks Nesrin. thank you um huge role uh and i think i mean you know we've got many people from series both in the audience and on the panel and facilitating and series is a classic example of using education as the tool and it's experiential education. It's touching, tasting, smelling. Um, and I don't know about others, but I certainly find when young people and children are engaged with issues, they actually become the strongest advocates. And I actually run away frightened from a number of um, the young people in my life because they're really on me about, you know, what are we doing? Um, I guess one of the things that we need to ensure in that education is that we are doing systems thinking and that we're not um, purely focused on, you know, here's the nuts and bolts of recycling, for example, but, you know, what do we mean? You know, what's the bigger picture? And, you know, obviously age appropriate communications around that, but um, that's the stuff that I think we need to see. And then I guess the other thing is all of us old, bastards actually creating space for younger leaders and younger voices. And um, I'm really conscious of that in my area of work. I work in academia and the, you know, it's purely hierarchical and you don't get to be a professor until you're, you know, 45 plus. And so there is an expectation that the professors are the leading lights and voices, but it's just not true. So, you know, I do a lot of work in my own sphere of trying, not trying, but just getting out of the way, like ensuring that um, younger people who've got great expertise and, and um, ideas to offer are given the space to do it. I'm also um, yes to that. And uh, when I went to the climate marches, I was in Byron Bay, the young people were leading the climate marches and they were really, really anxious. They were screaming at the top of their lungs and all I felt from them was the existential anxiety of what their future looks like. So yes, and I feel like those of us who are in, the, you know, adults, we need to hold safe space 
for them to feel that we are doing the work too. So showing up with solutions and then investing in those solutions with everything we have. So you move your banking to Bank Australia, you move your super to future super. We, you know, we need to say, guys, we are on this, we are on it. As the adults in your lives, we will hold the space to do everything we can with all of our capital. And when I talk about capital, a little bit controversial, but I don't think so. I'm talking about financial capital, creative capital, intellectual capital, love capital, that they feel supported. So when, while we might, um, create space for them to speak, they should feel held as well. Because I feel like a, a lot of young people don't feel held. They feel like they're gonna have to do all the work to repair and restore and regenerate. Um, and I'm, I'm working to really try and let the many, many kids in my life know. Uh, we also started a group called the Radical Hope Club. A whole group of mums got together in a living room and we said, how can we really think about how we're holding space for the young people, our children and other people's children in our community. So that's been really, really inspiring. Mm. Thanks, Barry. I think holding space is really, really important. Um, Laurel has a question for Jo. Oh, yes. Look, I was really interested in the work you're doing, Jo. I used to work with Swinburne many years ago, but I'm a social ecologist and systems theorist. And I think at this time, is the most incredible opportunity to map the relationships between all the different events that are happening in the world. And a lot of what you're talking to fit inside that map anyway. And when I heard the talking about government earlier, governments often put, want to put in a single simple solution to something. And mm. it's just such a waste. <laughs> and I just like, can we not get that there's all of these things are actually connected and, and map them? And so I was interested to hear uh, any perspectives uh, on that from you or any of the other panellists. And by the way, I have my copy of Dumbo Feather right here in front of me and I love <laughs> uh, David's a good mate of mine, David Holmgren, but I love the Peter McFadden articles. Fabulous. Awesome. Um, and your question is really about system mapping in order to work out the is, best. Yeah, to, to just hear any perspectives about yeah, that. Yeah, 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 sorry, I'm talking over you. So I think it's, it's, it's critically important, Lyle, and you're right. I mean, the, one of my greatest frustrations is the pull by everyone in institutions towards simple solutions for complex problems, and it just doesn't work. And so... I, for example, even the term best practice, you don't have best practice in complexity. You have emergence, you have patterns. And so whenever I go into a room to do any kind of training or education or workshop activity, I might, like, you've got to park best practice or you need to leave my room. Um, and it is important. In terms of the systems mapping in our work, we certainly do it. Um, but in terms of tools and people who are really on it, if you don't already know about Wicked Lab, which is a social enterprise owned by Sharon Zikovic and Emily Humphreys in South Australia, they do fabulous work using Wicked Lab to uh, map um, different systems and their points of interactivity. Uh, and it's being used quite a lot now by local government and, other un and some universities as well. Um, so it's a really good tool. Um, and um, there's no question that uh, we need that kind of work. The other thing we do at Swinburne is we've just, we've got a large grant at the moment to develop data cooperatives. Um, and at the moment, the, 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 the grant is to build the infrastructure. So we've got several data cooperatives that we're creating to help us trial and build the infrastructure, but um, it will be ready next year. And um, the point of that is a relatively low cost or free tool to um, map visually different data sets. And we do use that quite a bit with local government, for example, so that when, for, for, if you start to overlay housing data and um, uh, waste uh, or resource recovery data and uh, transport data and where um, local business is located, you start to see patterns where um, you can see why certain things are happening and why certain things are not happening. So I think that's another part of um, you know, the sorts of tools we need for good systems work. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> we have a question from Joe Kavanagh um, about the role of local government in facilitating and enabling social enterprise to grow local economies, jobs and resilience. Um, Nick, 
What's your view about the role of local government in enabling social enterprise to grow? Yeah, look, they've got a very important role um, that when I came to this job, I was surprised there hadn't been much work on it or it had, you know, there hadn't been the connections I would have expected between local government who who um, buy services and products all the time, um, why aren't they connected to local social enterprises so that they are not only getting the service or the product they want, mm. but they're also supporting a local smallish business and um, creating a local good. Um, so there's definitely much more that can be done there. Um, and I think there's certainly good relationships that Senvik are now developing um, with the Northern Metro um, local government areas. Uh, I mentioned before Gippsland. So I think there's just pockets of, of, of um, people who have heard about social enterprise and now doing something about it. Um, perhaps the language today has been too much focused on procurement offices or the people who buy stuff in government and it needs to move to um, you know, the corporate suite, the executive suite, you know, the people who, who run the organisations, when we talk about local government, who are running the place, actually thinking this way. And so that we are now thinking about alternative service providers that are social enterprise rather than mainstream business. You know, it's, it's really just saying we, we've, social enterprises deserved that competitive advantage, a bit like what Barry was saying, so that we direct them to, you know, Bank Australia, or we di direct them to those who have decided to put that as a core part of their purpose of why they exist, that they live by these ethical or, you know, environmental principles. Um, and that's why we should just choose them over um, other providers that we, that we currently have. So my vision for Senvik is that we can provide the, um, you know, statewide coverage, sector coverage. So every part of the economy, you've got social enterprise alternatives, and that's where we are directing people to. Um, can I just pick up one other thing that was mentioned earlier, just about government and young people. What's needed um, is leadership and leadership from government um, to sort of signal these, these things, these points, that um, this is the way government is going to look when it goes to purchase things or when it contracts a major road, a major construction piece. Mick, would you agree, though, that that leadership comes from the community first? Because government don't lead, usually. That's not traditionally what government does. Yeah, look, yes, but we need, so in Victoria, we're lucky that we've got a social enterprise strategy. We don't have that nationally. So we don't have that from the federal government, something that signals that social enterprise is recognised and it's even something we need to develop. And this is how we do it, a social procurement framework, whatever, all the other different things that we need. So we don't have that nationally. So that's why it's really important um, that, we, that we get that. Um, but we also need to, I think the view, the perspective or the energy has been too focused on the big end of social enterprise. And what we need to activate is the local part of social enterprise, which, you know, series does reflect. Like it is a wonderful story of um, waste, a, a land that was wasted, thrown away by local government, that the community got, you know, pulled together and created into, you know, amazingly self-sustaining um, place that people can go to reconnect with the the earth um it's you know that's that's a story that you know we would hope we can do with other areas that are underutilized like you know northcote golf course for example mm -hmm. um you know i think there are lots of things um that we could do when we mobilize the community you know where we connect with each other um and we and we enter into real dialogue around these things and yes we start showing leadership from the ground up mm -hmm. Thanks, I think that leads really nicely into Megan's question. Um, Lorna, are you able to invite Megan to ask her question? Hello. Um, Hi, Megan. Yes, I was just wondering, um, and I'm sort of gathering that uh, perhaps what you're doing is actually part of the answer to this, but are there some established models that manage community investment in local projects already? Because my husband and I, you know, we would like to invest some money and, um, and, you know, it can't, it can't always just be donations, right? So, um, say a local centre wanted some solar panels, is there a model yeah. That yeah. to yeah. Um, facilitate that and how do you find it and get that bigger? <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Barry? 
Yeah, well, that's what we've done with the Village Well up in Byron. Um, there were 10 investors who've invested the first like $50,000 each um, to get it started. Uh, and that's at establishment phase. So that's the experiment I know of that's in play. And that's specifically to do what you just mentioned. If there's a, a local business that wants solar panels, they'll, they'll borrow from the village well, etc. cetera. Um, that's the model that I know of. Do, Nick or Joe, do you know of active ones in Victoria? Um, no, and if you don't bury, then no one here will. Um, <laughs> But that said, uh, you know, the social finance is on a spectrum and there is um, impact investing models and there are other models. So um, uh, it's not, I'm not making a statement about what's better or worse. It's to do with purpose and also capital and the, the needs of the financiers. But um, the other model that I'm aware of is the um, community sub fund type model. So, um, you know, community foundations are the most distributed form of sort of you know basic grant giving so it's it's not an investment model it's a charity model but um you know there's a wide network of community foundations across australia and um um uh, the australian community foundations is the organization that that coordinates all of those i hear what i hear what the question was as well though wanting to invest um the villagewell.org is not the byron bay one i don't think that i just googled that that looked like something else um just FYI, uh, I'll try and get more info to everyone if, if they're interested in how that functions. Um, but uh, that problem of philanthropy versus core capital, I think people want to invest their money in things that will bring them a return. And that's what we have to be creating. We have to be creating opportunities that people can invest because there's like so many good people who are happy to invest their savings in something rad. But like, so they should be able to get an above market, like an above bank return, for example, for investing in the local community. And I think it's doable, but we need more examples. Yeah. There's examples of community shares and, and, and other models out of the UK. I mean, I can certainly pull some of that out after the meeting, after the discussion and provide those to Siri. Thank you. Um, so we have only a few minutes left um, and I might ask a question myself to begin to round out our conversation. Um, but there are still a few questions in the Q&A that we haven't um, got to and I'm sorry everyone that we're um, a little bit close to time now. Um, but we do, we will keep your questions on record um, and I'm not sure, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what will happen with them from here. Um, but um, yeah, thanks very much for engaging and asking the questions that you have. So um, my moving towards closing question is about the role of community organisations such as series, but not limited to series in um, supporting new and emerging economies. And I might ask um, each of our panellists to um, respond briefly to this question. Um, I'll throw it to you if you'd like to, to take it. Nick, you go first. So the role of the role that community organisations such as series can play in supporting new and emerging economies. Um, series has been a real trailblazer. So um, where to next? Hmm. Um, I think I think series has grown so much in the last few years. Maybe it is about going to new places, and whether that's about um, you know tapping into this. Uh, you know, desire to for local based action that maybe there's something else there for series as to incubate innovation or people who want to, um, you know, uh, take the series model and take it somewhere else that currently isn't isn't um, in Metro Melbourne. Um, look, I think um, I think series is a prototype for what we want in every pocket of Metro Melbourne. Um, so, you know, that, that would be the next step for me. Um, it's certainly um, very, it, it, series uh, is a great prototype for what social enterprise wants to talk about when we talk about our success stories, because it's that wonderful story of a community um, gathering together to um, create something really new that um, is teaching the next generation um, how social enterprises can thrive um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think that's all I've got to say about series. <laughs> um, 
I'll be very quick because we've only got a minute to go. Uh, so community organisations sit next to local government as the civic infrastructure of our nation, and that's unequivocally the truth. Um, we need to make sure though that our community organisations are walking their own talk and we, you know, there's, there can be a lot of self-referential activity. I'm not commenting on series here. I'm, I don't have my board hat on, um, uh, you know, but we can get pretty comfortable with ourselves, not look critically at what we're doing, not look critically at who's involved in our organisations, whose voices we're hearing. And frankly, going to some of the messages that um, I know Barry's very passionate about, who owns the assets? So we need to, you know, community organisations have still got more work to do. It's a constant evolution for us all. Thanks, Joe And Barry, the I role can, of community. I cannot for the life of me remember the question, but I'll answer based <laughs> on... <laughs> My brain doesn't go that long. Comments, comments, me, Barry, closing comments. I just think that we are 100% at the moment of reinvesting in the commons. Mm. And the commons means everything to the future of our thriving on this planet and the planet's thriving. And the commons in, is um, all sentient beings, all, all life on earth, all ecosystems, not just human ones. Uh, that proximity and that connection in urban environments is, um, has profound impact. Uh, and not only investing in the commons like series, but the commons between us, the space between us as human beings. As I watch what's happening in the world right now, I'm really personally trying to make space for people who don't think like me, um, people who don't invest like me, people who don't clearly look like me. That's always been a, felt pretty obvious to me as a Jewish person. Um, but I feel like that commons exists in both the most intimate fibres between us and in the, in the meta structures around us. And uh, it, it mustn't be taken from and extracted from. It has to be renewed, revitalised and restored. So here's to that. Thank you so yeah. much for what a great way to close our session today. Um, thank you so much to all of our panellists for coming along today. Um, Nick, um, Joe and Barry. Um, what a great conversation about transformation and resurgence, um, new economies and localization. We could just keep talking. Um, there, there's so much more to say. Um, for people who are interested in um, continuing to learn about ideas like this, um, check out the series School of Nature and Climate and the courses that are coming up um, in the not too distant future. Um, and also, as Barry said at the start of the session this weekend, um, the uh, Local Futures team are running World Localization Day and there's 24 hours of amazing, amazing. Um, presenters. Amazing. Um, Line up is insane. Talking about all the ideas we've been covering today and then some. So um, thanks very much to Lorna and Ben for managing behind the scenes and for everyone, to everyone for tuning in. Very much appreciated. And um, we'll be back next week with a conversation about climate change. Until then, um, be well, be safe. Um, thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Barry. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you all.